issue of online data sharing. So a lot of us are doing it, knowingly to different degrees, unknowingly or unknowing the extent perhaps of these with which other people can trawl and find some of the information. So in the process, the question that we're going to discuss with the panel is, are we exposing ourselves more than we should be? And from the organisational perspective, particularly perhaps from our employers, are we releasing things that are potentially betraying our business and giving away information? Or is there a risk that we're giving information away that the employer would prefer us not to? So just to set the scene on this then, so that's what I've just basically said about the implications of the sharing and should we basically be taking more care? And hopefully you've all got some thoughts on this which you can uh, share with us as we go. Just a few scene setting quotes around I suppose the, the way that the notion of privacy has evolved in recent years. So this quote, which you may recall from some of the media reporting around the time that was made from Mark Zuckerberg, um, the CEO of Facebook, of course, flagging up that perhaps users' attitudes to privacy today are far more relaxed than they used to be. And flagging up that the, the social norm is that uh, people are now far more comfortable with sharing information and not being so worried about who can see it. Okay, so it, this was summarised in many of the reporting of it as privacy is no longer a social norm, which is perhaps a slight distortion of what he actually says, but nonetheless, that's how it's been taken. More, slightly more recent quote from Vint Cerf, the, uh, the so-called father of the internet, um, flagging up that particularly as a way, uh, or a consequence of the way that we ourselves use the technology and what we're sharing, flagging that privacy may well be an anomaly. It's going to be increasingly difficult for us to achieve privacy thanks to the technologies that are now there, and more particularly the way we tend to use them. And then a slightly older quote, which basically sort of puts it fairly bluntly, from Scott McNeely, the then CEO of Sun Microsystems, you've got zero privacy anyway, just get over it. Basically, So this is our, I suppose, seeding the debate for our, our panellists. So I've got a few questions that I can pose to them in the absence of discussion. We'll start off with a, a question or two in a moment anyway, but the opportunity will be open to you as the audience to, to keep them talking, basically. So who have we got on our panel? And I've already been criticised this evening for being a little bit too uh, relaxed in my acquisition of the pictures and the fact that I've got some fairly pixelated versions of them. So I do apologise. You can see the palace in glorious high resolution in front of you here or in lower res on the screen if you prefer. So we have, um, well, we'll go from that end and I'll ignore the order on my slides. We have uh, Dr Shirley Atkinson uh, here from Plymouth University, so a lecturer in information systems. We've got John Finch, as you've already seen earlier, from Plymouth City Council. We've got Paul Ferrier from Technology and Information Services here at the University, our Enterprise Security Architect. And our guest this evening from outside of Plymouth is Omar Rana, a professor from Cardiff University. So all of them, I'm sure, have got some thoughts that they can share with us. And, uh, well, let's get rid of that. We'll keep the panel on the screen, actually. Um, the first question, then, and I'll start us off, and then we'll throw it over to you once. Given what we've seen about the use of technology to trawl um, the internet, and given the way that people are placing information online, should users be expected to know better? And if so, how should they be expected to know better? Where might they be able to get their guidance? And indeed, do they need it? And who'd like to start? Shirley's looking I'll, eager, I'll so I'll, I'll go I'll to Shirley start. first. For me, it's about context, and uh, where is the, you know, there is no one-size-fits-all, if you like, in, in my view. The people come from different backgrounds, they have different experiences, different needs. So that whole, well, users should be expected to know better, can come across as a bit arrogant from the perspective of software developers. Well, you know, the, it's not my software that's the problem, the users are all wrong. I, th I think that's the wrong type of approach to take. If we're thinking about users, um, there needs to be some thought as to their background, their educational attainment, um, their, their sense of vulnerability, if you like. Some of us are more vulnerable than others in different circumstances, and I think that needs to be accounted for. That's my bit. John? Um, should they be expected to know better? It depends on the circumstance. Um, I recently had received an email from LinkedIn saying my data had been taken from the LinkedIn site. I had my profile locked down pretty securely, put my faith totally in LinkedIn security, that got breached, um, not a lot I could have done about that. 
um, it is a case of potentially do the developers do enough? And I've, I've been recently made aware of a quite a large data breach where 5.2 million email addresses and passwords were dumped into Pastebin, um, just as a text file. And it seems that uh, data is being stolen all over the place. And I think what, one of the main issues is people don't actually understand the value of their personal data to someone who might be able to use it. So could they expect it to know better? Um, <coughs> In some cases, yes, but not every case. It's not a, a catch-all um, answer for that. Okay. Yeah. Paul. Thank you. John, John's absolutely right. Um, he's not the only LinkedIn person that got their uh, information stolen. I've, I've been a number of times and been talk, talk. Um, yeah, just don't go with the companies that I use for most things. Um, to echo what's already been said, really, um, it, it's a case of people the developers of the system should be able to advise users better rather than providing a static sheet of text. Here are our terms and conditions. This is what we're going to do with your data. People don't read that. If they put, provided the information in a way which is actually more useful to the readership and understandable, it's not in legal speak, at least then you're in a better position to make that informed decision because a lot of the time people will look at this and say, you know, there's 10 A4 sheets of paper, and um, okay, I'll check the box or I'll sign the piece of paper. It's, it's something that can be used across the board. Um, sure, so so I guess, you know, I, I take a, I think you guys give a great demo here. So essentially, you know, if you go back 10 years, maybe 12 years, you know, when Facebook was not there anymore. So, you know, if somebody said, right, that here's a piece of software where you're gonna tell everybody everything about yourself, right, you think you were crazy. Right, so, so what is it about people? I think we need to go back to, I guess, the, the motivations of why people want to share content. You know, why is it that people want to tell everything about their life on, on, on platforms like uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook? You know, what is the motivation for people to reveal personal details, you know, online? And I guess that, uh, so, so I guess first we need to understand that. And I guess the second issue is that many of these platform developers don't know the answer either. Because you know the number of times you have to change your policies on Facebook to upgrade your security policies means that they don't understand it either. So I think you know we are all playing on this this game, you know, in a completely unknown area. So I guess the first thing is right that what 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 is it about these platforms that that you know allows people or requires them or motivates them to share personal data? You know, if you knew that you know I could um, join your calendar data on on Google Calendar with your availability on Twitter, with your personal details on Facebook, I could really build a profile by looking at not just a single you know, social media site, but a whole variety of them. And so I think uh, the answer is, right, we are still exploring the space. <laughs> you know, so the question of whether they should be expected to know better, I think, uh, you know, is, is, I think, still a big challenge, so. Okay. And to so one further thing in the mix, you can actually have no online presence whatsoever but other people and other yeah. pockets of data, someone can build up a picture. And there is an example I know of someone in the Southwest um, where they actually got a researcher to say, they went to this researcher and said, I don't have an online presence, what can you find out about me? And managed to find everything about him through what other people have posted and what's available in, in open source um, situations. So um, he knew exactly what, that he hadn't shared anything, but nothing he could do about that. So I suppose that flags up actually that, again, it's not just the awareness of your own data, it's the awareness of what you're sharing and the impact that it can have on other people. So it's again that, that issue of general awareness of the value of this data and what somebody could do with it um, if they have a mind to do so. Does it, the comments so far, does that prompt any questions from the audience or any questions that you will have? Yes? Um, should the choice be made more obvious then about what data you're giving away is, is the first question. Um, and second part is, is data sharing unavoidable? So, for instance, you could go to someone and say, in, in the physical realm, I want to have a private conversation, but that person can then go and talk to someone else anyway. So, th I think there might always be the risk anyway. I, I think it's unavoidable, personally. Um, and it, we might actually live in a society where this has been going on for quite a long time, you just didn't know about it, we've just now got the visibility because it is online and it's easy accessible. 
for me, we're now, what goes on online used to happen in the village I lived in. <laughs> you know, everyone knew who you were, they knew what you had for breakfast, they knew uh, your movements, when you go to work, when you'd likely to come back. Uh, but now it's gone away from the local village, it's now international. Actually, I just wanted to, you know, so, so if you take, take a platform like Twitter, very much like what you guys use for your project, do you, do you, are you aware of the terms and conditions of Twitter data usage? So for example, right, suppose I send out a tweet, you put me on your tool as you know, I was in location X, and suddenly I delete my tweet. How would your tool respond? Saves right. So, so, sorry. It saves information. It saves information, but the question is right that according to the Twitter's terms and conditions, okay. if I delete a tweet, you know, somebody who's using that data should also delete their version, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and also uh, the question of you know the ethical use of this data is still a minefield. You know, we don't really understand. You know, if I delete a content on Facebook. Somebody might still have a copy of it somewhere. You know, so, so I think that... Uh, and that, that happens all the time, yeah. especially in privacy cases, where somebody has deleted tweets and screenshots uh, um, appear later on. Mm -hmm. um, and just from some of the super injunctions that have taken uh, place in the last few years, um, they've been blown, blown apart on Twitter very, very quickly. So there mm -hmm. really isn't any privacy there. Mm -hmm. Just as a question to the audience, because it's always quite interesting, how many people use Twitter? How many people are on Twitter? Keep your hands up. How many of you have properly read the terms and conditions? Okay, so slightly fewer than users. And similarly, Facebook, how many people are on Facebook? Read the terms and conditions fully? Yeah, good. So, the minority of users. And I think that's probably very representative of the wider population. Okay, further question, yes. This isn't a question, it's just it's people might find it interesting. There's actually a website called TOC semicolon DR, as in terms and conditions didn't read. And it's a website that basically reads terms and conditions for you. And it's like these people have but these people have gone and actually done it and they've taken down the key points. And you can look at this website to just know the actual most important bits of any terms and conditions of any frequently used online service. There we are. So those people who put their hands down rather too quickly, you might want to go and have a look at those for the sites that you use. Any other questions based on the, uh, the comments so far? Otherwise, I shall throw another question of my own. Um, how much can one rely on security in numbers in that with so many millions of users, surely no one's going to bother about my account? Um, the way, well, I take that, that 5.2 million it compromised email addresses and passwords. All they, that that would be used for is somebody who put that into a tool, um, different tool but similar um, concept that just searches thousands and thousands of websites, tries those usernames and passwords and looks for a hit. And that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for you specifically, they're looking for what they can get and if you happen to be the unlucky one which uh, used that username and password on every other website, um, that's where they start gaining the um, value from that data. I guess it's a case of if you're the CEO of a company, then uh, you're probably a bigger target anyway, because if they're then using the data that they found out about you to try and match against other company information, if they can find that you're you're a big shark or a bit of whale in these companies, you're the, you, you are the really big fish, then you're the prime target out of the set of 5.2 million. It's, if it, sorry. If it's there, they'll find it. But there is, I think there is also that whole, um, I suppose it depends on the context of the criminal behaviour or the, the intent uh, and your context. Uh, we know of identity fraud, so if you're likely to have a nice uh, glittering um, sort of, uh, I've forgotten the word now, the uh, profile for, you know, that can be used to then gain other access to other funding, um, credit rating, that was it, it escaped my, my mind there. But if you've got a, a, a good one and they want to use that, then that's a potential. But there's, yes, different risks in different contexts. And it, it's all about money. That, that's what all the criminals are after, um, trying to maximise the money they can get from these accounts. So, so I guess also it, it depends on how important you are in the social network. So for example, if, so if I were to draw a graph, of connectivity between individuals in a social network. 
If you are one of those nodes which has a high degree in terms of connectivity to other users, then you're more valuable. Uh, I guess there are people who do that kind of analysis where they try to look at, for example, uh, they do graph analysis on how people are connected on social media. So for example, uh, what is your degree centrality in that graph? Um, and if you happen to have an open account with a high degree centrality, you know, you're going to affect a lot of people. <laughs> So I think it uh, it depends on you know where you place yourself in that graph. So the, it's not just about numbers, but also other metrics that people associate with you with respect to the community that you're part of. And lots of people are doing uh, this kind of analysis with uh, uh, you know Facebook Open Graph, Open Graph API, and, and so on. So. Uh, so another question from me then. Should organizations be actively using tools such as the one that we've seen demonstrated this evening to find out more about what their employees are sharing and what might be being shared that has implications for the organization itself? Um, if I can go Go first. On. Depends on the organization. I can see a great potential for law enforcement, um, especially with data has been breached. Um, there is a Southwest cybercrime team. They could actually use that tool to find out where that data has been um, used and uh, the risk that data is at. So definitely for some aspects. Um, I think with certain organisations about using it, it's a down to a moral um, aspect. I find it very difficult to think that the council would uh, um, start using tools like this to track their employees. Um, but there are definitely some private companies that do that already. Any other thoughts from the panel? Just taking it a little bit wider, um, maybe not specific organisations, but I know um, having been through the process in the recent past, schools and catchment areas, if, if, you, if you're a very wealthy family and can afford a, to rent a property in the local catchment area of a better school, um, obviously all you need is, is proof of address, but if you can then use some other methods to say actually you know you don't spend 90 percent of your time at this location because you live 35 miles away why do you want to have your child come to this school so on a, a broader picture i could see there being more benefit to it but once again it's down to the moral mm -hmm. side of things I think there are organisations that do use tools such as that or you know, other, other ones that exist. Um, it's why they're using it that's the, that's the key point, I think. Uh, if it's um, you know, to have a go at someone, then mm, I think there's, there's a, a, a discussion to be had there. But if it is uh, about protection of the brand of the, of the business it, it itself, then uh, that's another, another discussion, if you like. Yeah, so I just wanted to just quick pick up on one. one uh, I think we should be very careful with this data. You know, because it's a lot of data out there doesn't mean it's, it's right. Because basically sometimes, you know, you can turn off your location on Twitter. You might only, you might only want to reveal things about yourself selectively that you want other people to know. So, you know, if I go to Barbados, you know, I might want to turn off my location because I don't want people to know for exactly the reason you mentioned. So I think, you know, the fact we get very carried away with the fact that there's a lot of data out there and we can somehow harvest and analyze this data to get some interesting understanding from it. But remember that there are other people who are gaming this data also. And I think we should be very careful on how we use this data. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, the fact that I go on holiday and I want people to know about it, <laughs> but there may be other places perhaps, uh, you know, that people visit or whatever. So I think we should be very careful on how we use this data to infer, to make the secondary inferences from it. So. I think that's an important part, the point, and, and it's that uh, what is the information we're giving out and what control do we have mm -hmm. over where that's going to go? And conversely, what inferences are being made just because I want to give out my location it may be that I'm with someone so boring I want someone else to come and find me <laughs> you know um, so it's it, it's a balance there maybe I want I want someone to know where I am any other comments from the audience or questions at this stage yes yeah, should companies enforce a privacy program so you said they give you a term of conditions and it's a long file um, should they should they then 
ask you a few questions, and if you got them wrong, then they can um, advise you on why it's important and why you should be aware. I, I think you find quite a few companies actually do that already, and um, in the terms and conditions, it's, um, they have clauses about bringing the company to distribute, etc. And there was a famous example a few years ago where Tesco employees were making um, unsavory um, comments on social media about Tesco, um, and that put the company in distribute. So quite a lot of companies do have those already. It's whether the um, employees are. Um, fully aware of the implications and what it means and what they're signing up to. Certainly I think it's part of an, uh, an induction process that I've been through when I've worked for the NHS for example. Um, working for smaller companies, it wasn't really thought of. Um, so there's those balances there too. I mean, we've made a few points about finding out what people are sharing and you know, the implications, holding them accountable for it. Thinking about it from the, the more supportive side, what should or could organisations be doing to help enable safer, more informed use of the technologies that could help the, the users as individuals as well as as employees within the organisation? And do we think companies are generally doing as much as they could? So what could they do and are they doing it, basically? So, so I could talk from the university perspective, right? So. So uh, I don't know how many people here work at universities. So when we publish, a, you know, so we want when we do research at universities, which is publicly funded through it comes from, you know, tax tax money. So we want to be able to have the highest impact from this research, and how we can use social media to basically convey our message to as wide a community as possible. Because basically, sometimes when you publish papers, these papers are behind a paywall that many people cannot access. So the question is, right? How do we use social media to perhaps, uh, you know, go to alternative communities and, and propagate? And, and many universities are beginning to do that. So in, in uh, universities, we have these things called alt metrics or alternative metrics of how you measure the impact of research. So in addition to your publications and your citation counts, uh, the, how many people have retweeted your research? How uh, public organizations or the media have engaged with it are all important metrics that universities are teaching employees of how to use. And I think that's a very positive step in terms of promoting and you know, improving impact for research. So. Mm. And that's interestingly taking a positive view yeah. on how the technology could be used to the advantage of the individuals if they understand it. Yeah. Sure. I always think it would be interesting to have some marketing lecturers here because I think they would have a different perspective on, on the use of social media and that positive promotion of, of, of how do you present your shiny best self and um. it's uh, yeah, it's one of the things that uh, the group of the, the winning team um, were talking with marketing our DPC department about recently um, and the head of marketing pulled up uh, dumb ways to die the video clip um, about the Australian uh, train safety campaign the students haven't seen it before but it's if you can put across the right message in a way that's fun and it will engage with the audience it's easier to go in so it's one of the things that uh, the group will be looking at mm -hmm. with DPC to try and make sure that we've got a, a you know a few marketing ideas ahead of the start of term if we can get the message across about you know, if you're using this data in a um, in an interview environment, would you say what you're posting on social media? Mm -hmm. if, if we can put that message across in a, a friendly and pointed way, mm -hmm. it's uh, you're halfway there. Okay. Sure. Um, going on to um, how organisations can support employees, the national government actually publishes um, quite detailed guidelines on how civil servants should use um, social media in which context. And because you can use it in a public context um, and also in your private life and that, that they emphasise you need to keep these separate and um, have a fine dividing line between them. And, and those guidelines have been adopted by several local authorities and they're at, they actually publish them and the government's got a policy of publishing um, a lot of information now openly um, They've gone for a more transparent approach rather than um, uh, pub uh, publishing things behind sort of um, 
it, it, in intranets where people can access it. Everything's published on .gov.uk, and these guidelines are freely available for everyone. And they are useful for any organisation really just to mm. um, think about some of the, the um, concepts that employees might not um, consider. Just simple things like um, use of and style of language when you've actually associated your um, social media profile with your employer. Because <coughs> it might not actually fit in with the um, in culture of that organisation. Okay, so we've asked the audience already if you're social media users, and we've established that most of you are using at least a couple of the services. So, hands up again if you feel you've been informed sufficiently or you've found sufficient guidance about safe use of social media. How many of you have looked for it? Okay, so for the benefit of the recording, which isn't recording all of you, and there were about four or five hands went up, which isn't the majority of the room. So again, there's that issue there that we're all doing something with this, but the degree of, well, guidance that we've found, that we've sought, that we've received, is perhaps less than it could be for the reasons that we've been talking about. So, I mean, thinking a little bit further, we, I think we've already established through the, the, the opinions of the panel and some of you in the audience that this data is going to be there, whether we've placed it there or not ourselves. Other people can put things out there about us. So, to some extent, the genie is arguably out of the bottle and we're not going to be able to put it back. So, are there things, and here's the, the question for the panel, are there things that we can do that try to safeguard against the exploitation more, recognising that the data is available, how can we safeguard against it being used in a negative way? Stomping now. <laughs> 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 not expecting that one. Uh -huh. um, but about the genie being out of the bottle, mm -hmm. I mean, my personal view is um, the internet's been going for um, quite a number of years. It really exploded in the mid 90s when um, a lot of people started using it at home, and there's a lot of historical data that people have just forgotten about that is getting compromised all the time. So, yes, the genie is <coughs> definitely out of the bottle. It's getting people to understand, um, one, the value of, of the data and, and the risk they actually face. And um, I'm aware of an organisation that recently had a data breach and um, I got notified that their recommendation was that you change your password and that you don't use that password <coughs> on um, other websites. And this is something Google are actually looking at doing um, later on this year. They're actually going to be phasing out passwords um, altogether because that's the weakest link um, for many websites. Once you've got a password, and if it's the same password on every website, that's a lot of data people can get. So it's making people understand um, the different risks and how to protect themselves in those particular ways. Mm. I'm intrigued. If they take away password, what, what goes there instead then? Um, they're, they're coming up with a concept of, of verifying your identity using um, <coughs> several different factors. Um, and and it's, it's called Project Abacus, and it's very much uh, in the beta stage at the moment. But um, <coughs> taking bits from social media, um, <coughs> for example, when you log on to Gmail now, um, if you enable two factor authentication, you can only access it from that particular device. So it's actually. Okay using concepts such as that. And building up somebody's identity from a variety of small sources that have been verified and um, approved, um, rather than, and that's actually how they verify the identities. Because more and more websites now are using, um, instead of you creating your own account for that website, they'll ask you to use Google Plus or Facebook as the um, point of verification. So it, it's moving over to that concept. I've noticed that for a lot of things. Um, I, I have Instagram and I use that through Facebook, so I don't need a separate password for that. Mm. So. so, so I guess that uh, you know, one of the wow. <laughs> so one of the things Intimate that uh, now. <laughs> would be interesting would be to. Uh, so I think there is a need for a, a kind of. There's a business model, if I may use that word, uh, for creating a, a kind of a company that creates that that uh, monitors all the data about you. So, so for example, you could think of it like a data locker. So what you do is you have you have data on, on Facebook, you have data on Twitter, you have data on Google. Who owns this data? That's the first question, right? Do, do the platform owners have this data? So if you generate data on Twitter, is that your data or is that Twitter's data? Right? So I think we need to be very clear on that. 
who, who is, where is the ownership of the data reside? And is there a potential for a company that comes in and tries to aggregate your data across all these different sites and sees what is happening to it, right? So, for example, if a marketer goes to Twitter, you would like to know whether somebody's accessed your data. So I think that kind of informed consent would be a very interesting way to deal with this kind of data problem. So uh, one of the things that, that there are projects, there are research projects that are looking at this concept that very much like you have a locker, right? You put your stuff in a locker. You could create a locker which tracks your data across different sites. And then you have a kind of a direct access to it. You can monitor it. You can very much like Experian. Oh, so, like your credit yeah. so if you go to Experian, you know, if you can't get a mortgage or, <laughs> you know, you can go to Experian and they can. So can we do that for data? And can, and can I, so you know, would people be willing to, so, so here's a question for you guys, right? If I said that, you know, all these companies own your data, would you be willing to pay a little bit of money as a subscription price to track your own data? Or would universities, for example, uh, so the question is, if you knew that there was your data out there, which could potentially have problems for you in the future, would you be willing to pay a subscription for this third co company to operate? Right, so there are business models that we haven't really explored yet, which could address this issue, but... Uh, and as you said, that's the way it works with Experian and credit reference agencies. You pay, you can pay a monthly fee to have access to your credit profile, see who's been searching your details, etc., and keep an eye on your rating, so you're as informed as somebody else uh, if you were trying to take out credit. So yeah, there is a potential there. John? And um, that particular model, um, I don't know if anyone's aware of uh, what they're doing in Estonia. Um, Estonia is a fairly new country, established in 1991, um, has embraced the digital world and been able to quite dramatically, and they've come up with a digital passport and a similar concept to that where um, the individual is actually um, in control of their own data and it's all linked through something called the X-Road, um, all various different data sets and they can actually see who's accessed it, um, uh, approved certain accesses, withdrawal, consent, um, they're in full, full control of their own data. But the way um, Estonia have been able to do it, it's a fairly small country, 1.2 billion, mm -hmm. everyone's been um, sort of engaged from the start, and um, because they were creating the country, they were able to start from, uh, totally mm -hmm. from scratch. Um, but it's a very good concept, and there's quite a lot of um, interesting things about Estonia, mm -hmm. and it's worth um, mm -hmm. looking at in the context of what we're talking about now. So should should a county council, for example, if I because you have data about you know as you as you sorry to uh, yeah. so 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 here's a scenario. I mean, as a county council, you have or as a city council, you have data about uh, you know your your financial data about people. Mm -hmm. and we were mentioning at Cardiff. Cardiff has um, all the buses in Cardiff have free Wi-Fi. So every time you connect to the Wi-Fi portal on a bus, they know who you are because they can track your device ID. So you know, city councils, county councils are going to gather all this data about individuals. So would individuals be willing to subscribe to this data, you know, well by city councils, maybe in the future? Well, <laughs> individuals can actually request all the data okay. um, a public authority um, holds about it. Now that's part of um, national law, part of the Data Protection Act. So um, people can do that. Just what um, isn't available at the moment is a, an instant portal where people can mm -hmm. go and see who's accessing it. And mm -hmm. um, that, that model's quite a way away for us at the moment. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Just tracking back to something that was mentioned earlier about old data being there and also Omar's point earlier about people controlling what's visible about them. How many people have done a search for themselves online and found a wealth of information that's no longer actually up to date or current? Mm -hmm. So have you, have you looked online and found that there's stuff there that was true at one point but it's no longer relevant and then you think about the number of accounts that you've created on systems and services that you perhaps no longer even remember that you created accounts on. And so there's sort of artifacts of your past sitting around on various systems with data that's accurate or not to varying degrees. And I think that, again, when we're talking about harvesting information and looking for what's there, there's possibility to get a very different impression to what the reality would be. So in answer to that question, just for the camera, a few hands sort of raised. So I don't know if that prompts any further discussion. So it's, it's a, an interesting one because um, when I first got a mobile phone, I used that mobile phone's provider, 
provider's email address um, that I was given, and I used that for the lifetime of my contract. When I left, I lost my email address. <laughs> and I know that I purchased things online using that email address and various little bits and bobs, but I know ha now have no access back in, so I can't do anything about it. Admittedly, yes, I've been through and the sites that I do remember, I've changed the password for. But yeah, there's the, if I'm one person and that's one contract, that's only one set of data, but yeah, it's, there's information everywhere and there's, there's orphan data left, right and centre that I have no control over. And you might have won the lottery and they've not been able to tell you. Probably, yes. Any other thoughts from the audience at this stage? Yes. Um, kind of drawing back on some of the previous questions as well. Um, it's very, I feel it's very easy to put the blame you know, kind of on the company saying they should educate people more as to how the security is, or other companies should be set up to, to show people very far marketing, show people how like all the data is. Um, with the new generation being so immersed in technology at such an early age, a lot of young kids having Facebook pages, stuff like that, um, isn't it more important that we educate the general public and more importantly children who will have data on there so early and will continue to be on there until well, it's gotten rid of, if they ever do, but if they're not educated, I feel like well, maybe the maybe the information technology kind of education needs to be structured in a way that they're made more aware of security, or maybe there's just a general public is a lot more important that we educate people rather than have the companies say, um, blame on the companies really. So I'll go to Shirley for that one because I thought the hand would already be up. <laughs> so um, there is an awful lot already going on in schools uh, through the government organisations such as CEOP, um, which is the Child Exploitation Online Protection People. Um, it's already in the national, the new computing national curriculum. So I think you're right in that actually there needs to be that strand, but there is. It, it, and but we all know that you know you pitch up at a, as a school child, you pitch up at a lesson. Are you going to listen? Are you going to be zoning out, thinking what am I having for tea tonight? Or you know, are you going to engage with with what, what's being said? Who knows? And there are different children are going to be in different places at different times. Um, for some of them, this might be, they might be quite vulnerable, and they're the ones that will need the protection. Um, one of the issues is the, the, um, the, the young people looking for love, if you like. I just want someone to love me, and oh look, this person's talking to me, they must care about me. <coughs> oh, mm, right, okay, that was inappropriate. So, it, it, it's looking at those different um, sort of scenarios, if you like. And when it comes to adults, <coughs> Um, there's the get, government's Get Safe Online. They do have adverts on TV, but it's it's how do they engage every member of the population and get them to understand and verify they understand the message. And that's the most difficult thing. I think um, nobody's come up with an answer yet. Uh, uh, talking about uh, school children again. So it's I've got a child who's in year six at the minute, going up to secondary school. They've just gone through their SATs. There's so much change in the curriculum that there's no time for them to do ICT properly at that age. Now, you know, my son's 11, he's got a mobile phone. We try and provide him with the right sort of information, but when he's at school, I don't know what they do with their devices. They're supposed to hand them in, whether they do or not. You know what kids are like. It's, it's a challenge to try and uh, keep ahead of your mates. Um, a, a letter came home during the year, it was a case of actually do you realise that in your class there are X amount of people that have Google Play accounts playing video games that are age inappropriate. It's really difficult with children, uh, as has already been mentioned, to get the message across to all of them in the same way. Don't get me wrong, I'm completely on board with what you're saying, because if we don't tell people at that age, we're never going to make a difference going forward. So, but it needs to be something that we can keep reiterating through at different age groups. So secondary school, degree courses, you know, whether I would, there has to be an element of information security, I would suggest, in every degree course that is done because we're all using technology nowadays. Whether that's the case or not, whether it's 
appropriate. That's I'm not here to comment on that, but <coughs> if we can keep reiterating, we will get that. And if you put, put the, the same concept under car driving, to actually drive a car you have to pass quite a comprehensive test, take loads of lessons, you understand the risk, etc. But you still get accidents, you still get people seeing the 30 mile an hour speed limit um, going way over that and causing accidents. So it's, um, no matter how, how much you put the message over, some people will just not listen and um, do what they want anyway. For me, I think it's important to keep trying the different avenues and not to think, well, oh, well, we've, we've told them once they should have listened or, or, or whatever. And it's having multiple channels and, and keeping at it, really. Um, there and then over here. So, Torbjörn. Would it be desirable and possible to have an age limit on social media? Mm. Well, there's already the, um, <coughs> you've got to be over 13 to sign up uh, on uh, American sites because of the Copper Act. Um, but you see parents helping, assisting their children on getting on earlier. I think for some people, it's whether they see the age limit as being appropriate, actually applying to them. Well, I'm growing up, you know, I, I can handle this, and then maybe not. So, so I guess when you sign up for an account, I think there is a, some clause there which says, you know, probably there is an age clause that, that goes back to the terms and conditions issue. I guess the question is, right, that data is not just generated from social media. You know, every time you play a game online, that's collecting data. You know, every time I, and, and, the, and the more interesting challenge comes when many of these social platforms are embedded within other kind of gaming environments. You know, so if you buy Xbox or whatever, there's already a social platform within it, which does not have to be Twitter or Facebook, but they have their own channels. You know, when Sony got hacked, for example, a couple of years ago, you know, the idea that all that data from Sony platforms was already accessible online had nothing to do with social media. So the data collection channels are quite diverse, you know, more than we, we you know we, we think of normally. So, but I suppose if you turn the tables in that light with alcohol, it's not illegal. I don't know actually if it's illegal to buy alcohol, but it's the selling of alcohol that, to an underage that that's illegal. In the same way, it would be illegal to provide a social, you know, the responsibility would be on Google and Facebook. Yeah, but, uh, I think that that is an interesting question that. So, so I think that's a, that, that is in fact a very interesting question that what a responsibility do the platforms have? So uh, for example, just going to cyber hate, you know, mm -hmm. hate speech online, right? You know, so should uh, social media platforms police hate speech? You know, if you're being a racist towards somebody or you're, you know, basically getting a slur on somebody, should the social media platforms censor that content? And so what, you know, what, what is the, so for example, right now what happens is, right, that in Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you can report content by saying abusive content and they try to take it off. But should they be more proactive in doing that? I think, uh, you know, that's a... <laughs> um, I, I think it'd be very, very difficult for them to be more proactive because mm -hmm. they'd have to have millions and millions of staff yeah. assessing mm -hmm. every piece of content. So they need to but they can do it automated tools, right? I mean, if they, uh, Facebook is already, they use that kind of tools for marketing. So why, you know, if they want to say, all the people who, you know, mention a particular, if you mention a particular product or you, you know, they use that to do advert placement. You know, every time you go search on Google, you see adverts on the right hand side on, on <coughs> Facebook about, you know, all the places you wanted to go to. <laughs> you know, so they're already doing that. Why can't they do this also? But, but you're right, I mean, it's, it, is, it is challenging, right? Yeah. But e even if they do it on the, the public platforms of Twitter, yeah. um, then people will take their, their views and opinions off onto a different platform that's not police to work. So yeah, that's, mm. no, but that's, yeah, that's a good point. There's a question somewhere uh, here. Uh, oh, I had a, a contribution to this <laughs> same topic you were just talking about. Another thing that might muddy the waters a bit is where does freedom of speech come into this? Like, what's the line between um, censoring inappropriate content and and uh, in, impacting on people's freedom of speech? Absolutely. Yeah. 
I think that's a fair point. Um, and I think even if you did have the automated technology to pick out certain things, it would be easy to spot, I suppose, the extremes, but it's where, you, exactly as you say, where you draw that line as it gets closer to you know, the freedom of speech issue, which some people will, will have a very much more conservative view than others. But let's, let's get the question from here, here, and here. And then... <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, so with social media, if it's such a big issue with leaked data and people sharing their locations there, why haven't the companies just gone straight to security commands? Right? If, you, if the only people who you want to know are on your friends list, then where are you trying to share it to? If you're going to put a post up, then they're already going to know. So where is the data going to go? You might as well just mock it up and then secure it as best they can and then that's kind of eliminated, eliminated the majority of the threat the best the company can do and instead of setting up a, a new company with a massive data center which costs thousands of millions of pounds just have all the companies just go yeah we'll just put the security up instead of just saying oh sign up but instead of telling you about the security start with we'll just have it really low and then let you find out eventually why an app on TV why they then just sit with people? Um, I think they are getting better. Um, Facebook, for example, has a, you can check what people can see about you um, tool on there now, which a few years ago that just didn't exist. Um, but, but with the um, location thing, you can have your um, all your locations turned off. All it takes is for someone else to tag you with them in a particular location and um, just circumvented everything. So you are relying on other people in, in a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. So you've got geo geo tagging of data on most digital cameras now. This is where this photo was taken. So even if you're just uploading photos, um, you could be leaking that information. Um, no, I'm sorry. Should have posted it online. Down to it ourselves. <laughs> I suppose one of the things linking off that is it, it goes back to the business model of the sites that are providing the services. I mean, obviously, from, from their perspective, it's making the relationships between the, the data that's posted and the, the more open sharing, the more they've got to deal with. And so in, they've gradually, I think, in response to some of the pressure, increased the level of security, but left to them, the defaults have been broadening rather than having things more locked down. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a, it kind of goes back to the fact that um, even if there weren't like a, an option to take an untrue spot, if, if it was literally like, there is no geotech, we're not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of it and all your friends and that, just keep it as it is. And then, so no one has a choice. It's just either max security or you don't sign up. And then it comes to the other point is, um, do the companies just want to, do they actually want to secure it here? Like, do they actually just want to, let it as much as they can. Well, look at the business model. The business model is based on advertising. Yeah. So they need to build up a profile of that person. And the way they do that is by gathering as much information as possible. If they had it locked down so that nobody could see um, anyone else's data, effectively that business model has gone and they wouldn't actually make any money. So there is a bit of a conflict, conflict there between the security and what they're trying to do and how they sell products. Let's move ourselves on to the next question. Um, well, my question was linking to that. Um, with the talk about um, the terms and conditions being so complex um, and of choose for users, the reason that, or part of the reason social media um, companies do that is because they don't want you to lock down your account. Um, and they don't want you to just post information once a week um, and non trivial information. So is it possible to actually find a middle ground between profitability for a company and privacy, or are the two in common I think I think that is the you know the multi-million or a billion dollar question, right? So the question is, right, where do you where is the line between privacy and you know that you mentioned, right? So so I, th I guess the question is, right, that. It's more, it's, it's more than that, you know, because why is it that people make their profiles open on Facebook? You know, all the stuff that you've heard about security, people still have open profiles. And uh, the question is, right, that why do people do that? And, and you know, if, if, if the company bombards you with, you know, so, so let me give you an example, right? Suppose, suppose you're sitting in front of your computer and somebody told you that, um, 
you know, that somebody is sending a malware to your machine, right? Some people will just ignore it, still. You know, it's, it's the way, you know, the, the question is, right, that how do people respond to these kinds of messages about privacy and security? You know, some people just ignore the fact that they have, you know, so, so I think it's more than just the platform versus privacy. I think it's also about education and understanding of how your data is being used, the, the linkage between your profiles across different sites. So, you know, people still make their profiles open. Why, why do they do that? <laughs> you know, so. And, and to address the, the question directly, um, Facebook and Twitter, they've just got one business model, that's to provide um, the social interaction. Um, there are other social media sites, um, Google Plus is a good example, Yammer, which is Microsoft's own, which is sort of, uh, they're not the main business model, but for some reason they just haven't taken off um, anywhere near as large as Facebook or Twitter. And one of the reasons, for example, Yammer, you have to have a, um, a LinkedIn, LinkedIn account um, with Microsoft that's corporately um, approved, etc. So it is, it is tied down um, quite considerably, um, but they just haven't taken off on the um, uh, sort of social platforms as much as uh, the big players. Mm -hmm. Final question over here. Okay, uh, with the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning, there will be the increased capacity for bots to mimic other people. Should there be some sort of centralised identification verification system? Or is there some other solution? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's a tough one. There's, there's been talk um, in the past about centralised um, IDs for, in the UK, ID cards, etc. There's always been a very big public backlash because there's a great um, portion of the population that um, don't want uh, a central ID because people can, they can be tracked and they've got um, different personas. They just want to um, keep private. So um, we've tried to do it in the past, and in an ideal world for um, a lot of us, yes, it'd be great to have one centralised ID so you can verify everyone's identity, but there's a, a big group of people, um, and especially the criminal fraternity, that don't want to be tracked and they don't want that um, central ID. Um, so it, it's always going to be a, um, a big aspect for public debate on whether we introduce something like that. And you almost got the on the flip side. What happens if someone steals that one centralised ID? Mm -hmm. um, the implications for that could be quite phenomenal. Actually, that's an interesting point. That uh, you know, well, one thing that has happened in recent years is that if you have a Facebook or a Google account, often when you sign into a third-party portal, you use your Google or Facebook credentials. I don't know if you've seen that. So mm -hmm. rather than get another username and password. What you do is you bootstrap off a, of your Google account, right? So you say, I want to connect to this portal, so I'll try to redirect you via Google. So in fact, Google and Facebook's uh, authentication mechanisms, in some way, are turning into a digital identity, which you know whether it's good or bad. And the and the reason is that um, many. So, so so suppose I create a new, suppose I create a new portal today, right? You know, it goes back to this identity issue. And what I could do is rather than you know, get person another username and password, I could bootstrap off Google because there will be one less thing the person has to do and one less thing I have to do as a developer. So in fact, uh, in many ways, your Google identity is turning into your digital identity in many ways. You know, whether whether that's intended or not, <laughs> you know, it's another story, so. If these companies doing it already, yeah. then it's still possible for someone then to replicate, you know, to, to pretend to be someone else. Or for a bot. So that's why. So if they're doing it anyway, why shouldn't there be a centralized system that does the same thing? So that's why when Google will will send you these uh, messages to verify your identity periodically by requiring you to put in a phone number. You know, you have to put a phone number in where they get you a authentication token that you enter into a. You know, so they use a whole bunch of other stuff to try to. And many but times, it still doesn't remove the yeah, speaking yeah, of them. You can, you can still take photos Absolutely. of someone else, say, yes. I, I am this person, yes. uh, you know, my other account was hacked or something, so I've got a new account, please connect with me, and then direct steal your data. And, and, and using machine learning and so on, they could already have mined a lot of data about this other person that it's pretending to be, uh, and then use that to, in a conversation to, to kind of gain access. Yes, so, so my understanding is that. Google is already trying to look at dormant accounts 
and they also tried to look at uh, some traffic on user accounts. Uh, they weren't doing it before, but they are trying to improve on, uh, you know, whether a new account has been created, it's just generating a lot of traffic, especially for spam uh, monitoring, for example. But you're right, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely, yes. And, and going back to the mistrust, um, in Bristol they had a program where they were centralizing all the health data. So you could, if you got um, had an accident in the street, you could just go to the nearest doctor's surgery and they'd have full access to all your health data. They wrote to all the citizens of Bristol and, um, for their consent and there were still 2,000 people or 2,000 households objected to that happening, even though it's for their benefit because there is a, an intrinsic mistrust of um, Big Brother watching you in certain aspects of society. Okay, now I'm conscious I've seen a few more hands um, up to ask questions, but I'm going to be mean now in the interest of time and begin to draw us to a close. But before we do so, a final question for each of the panellists to answer briefly in turn. So if there was one thing you could do or one bit of advice that you could offer in relation to this issue, what would it be? And because she pulled a face and looked uncertain about <laughs> that, I won't start with Shirley, I'll start with Omar. <laughs> Gosh, so what do you mean? You in terms of privacy? Yeah, yeah it's a, the, the whole issue is online data sharing, the things that we've been talking about. If there was something you could do with the magic wand that I'll provide you with afterwards, or one bit of advice that you could give to people to protect themselves or to improve things, what would that be? Yeah, so I think it's more about trying to get people becoming more aware. It's, it's improving awareness. I think it's education about how data is being used, you know, what is happening to your data. Improving awareness right from, you know, as somebody said, uh, security should be a part of something you teach right from the beginning in schools that goes up into university. So I think it's it's improving that awareness is very important. So, okay, thank you. Oh, um, so very similar lines. I'd say sharing. So if you see that somebody's doing something and they're not aware, but it's as open as it it is, if you tell them, you're spreading the message. It's it's the quickest way, the social way to get the message out there. The more people that you can tell that you can assist, the quicker we'll be in a better place. John? Sure. I'd encourage people to take more responsibility for their own data and realise what value that has for someone else. Mm -hmm. And do periodic checks and type in your own name to Google. <laughs> find out what is out there. Mm -hmm. I suppose I default to the usual uh, advice of, well, if you don't want any, anyone to know about it, keep it to yourself. <laughs> Okay. Short, sharp advice there. And I think with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank the panel for their wise words. <laughs>